All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's shoot for 11 through 15 here. Uh, number 11 is an interesting question. If f of x plus 1 plus f of x plus 2 is equal to f of the quantity x1 plus x2, then which of the following could be f? Um, you could try some numbers, um, you know, make x1, 2, and x2, 3, and then x1 plus x2 would be 5, right? And you could see if it works for those numbers. Um, I'll just do a quick check sit here, and uh, we'll see if um, we can't figure out what the right answer is, and then I'll show you how to do it um, more generally. So uh, if x1 is 2 and x1 is 3, then f of this would be 3, this would be 4, 3 plus 4 is 7, and this would be 6. So that's, that does not work. Um, I'm just plugging these numbers into the function, right? And it looks like this does work, right? Because that would be 4 and 6, and then this would be 10. So this one does work. Could be. Now, we're trying it with actual numbers. So just because we find one that works that, that's not conclusive, uh, we've got to make sure. Um, now, uh, 1 half plus 1 third is certainly not 1 fifth. That doesn't work. Um, I hope that you don't think that's how you add fractions. <laughs> You'll be in big trouble. Um, and then it doesn't work here because exponents don't, um, e squared plus e to the third, uh, they're not even really what we would consider to be like, like terms, not the same exponent. It's certainly not equal to e to the fifth. And then if you square them, um, that would give us 4 plus 9 is equal to 25. That's certainly not true either. So it looks like b is right. Um, how do you justify that in general? I'll just take you through how to do it with a couple of them, and then you can try the other ones if you want. Using x1 and x2, you'd say, well, let's see. f of x1 would be x1 plus 1 plus, you probably figured out how to do this, right? That's what f of x2 would be. And then we're trying to figure out, is that, in fact, equal to f of x1 plus x2? Well, x1 plus x2 plugged into this would look like that, right? And the problem here is you've got the plus 1 twice, and it's only once over here, so uh, no, it's not. Then you can go through the other ones. Um, because of the distributive property of multiplication, that's why this one does work, right? Multiplying this by 2 and this by 2 is the same as multiplying them both by 2. So it's, uh, it's for distribution that it works. Okay, so uh, was our correct answer was B. Number 12, if the domain of the function is x is the absolute value of x is greater than 1, remember what that looks like? That That's like all of if this is 1 and negative 1, that's like all that stuff and all this stuff, right? Um, then what's the range of the f function? Well, let's, um, let's consider some of those numbers and see if we can't figure that out. So if we plugged in, well, we can't plug in 1. It's not part of the range. If we plug in things that are just a tiny bit bigger than 1, and square them, then we get numbers that are just a tiny bit bigger than 1, right? So we have 1 minus something that's just a hair bigger than 1. That will give us a very, very small negative number. 1 divided by negative close to 0 is going to be uh, like negative infinity, right? You can imagine if you plugged in, uh, for example, 1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1 squared is 1.21, so we'd get 1 minus some small number, and uh, or 1 minus, sorry, we'd get a small negative 0.1 left over. And as you get closer to 1, you can make that arbitrarily small, but it will be negative. And uh, then as we get bigger and bigger, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we'd have 1 over 1 minus a huge number, so 1 over negative infinity, which is going to get closer and closer to 0 from the negative side. So it looks like b is our correct answer. And when you come down here, since we're squaring this number, the fact that we're doing 1 and bigger and then negative 1 and smaller, it's going to behave in exactly the same way. So you can kind of reason through that that is the correct answer. Um, 
I might remind you at this point that this, all of these problems were supposed to be done without the aid of a graphing calculator. If you have a graphing calculator, you can determine that maybe a little bit more easily. Uh, number 13, the graph of y squared equals x squared plus 9 is symmetric to which of the following? Um, well, the fact that the y is squared uh, and the x is squared, the x being squared tells us that it has y-axis symmetry, and the y being squared tells us that it has x-axis symmetry. Um, and symmetry about the origin, uh, let's see, let's think about that. That would mean if it was also an odd function, because both of those are being squared. Well, it's not a function, right, So because the, the, of the y squared. So let me take a slightly different approach. This is what I would do, because I am a math teacher, and I taught, once upon a time, honors algebra 2. Did you know that? Um, in Rhode Island. And I know that in when you took honors algebra 2, you studied conic sections. And with a little bit of rearranging, you can rearrange this to look like this. And that might remind you, maybe you should pause for a second and see if you can remember what kind of conic section this is. Pause. All right, you're back, maybe with an answer. It's a hyperbola. Since the y comes first, it opens up and down. And since there are nines on the bottom of each one of those, that tells us that the, the little box, I don't know how you were taught to do this, but I always taught it, like, you sort of frame it out with a little box. These are the slant asymptotes, and kind of comes in like this, and then the same on the bottom. And now we can... Uh, now that we know what that looks like, we can see some of the symmetries. Is it symmetric with respect to the x-axis? Is it a reflection over the x-axis? It is. Is it a reflection of itself over the y-axis? It is. If we um, turn the page 180 degrees, come sa, then we still have the same thing. So it has all of those symmetries. Um, there are other ways of approaching that, but I think that would be my favorite. The um, number 14, next. Figure above shows the graph of a sine function for one complete period. Which of the following is an equation for the graph? I'm not going to look at those. I'm just going to look at this and try to um, create that graph. So it's a sine wave, right? Starts at the origin. So y equals sine of, it might be a number here and a number here, right? Now usually if it's just an x, then the period of the function of the sine function would be 2 pi. If um, we want the period to be something else, the period, which is 2, is equal to whatever number is here. It might have been b when you learned how to do this in uh, algebra 2 precalculus, divided by 2 pi. So b looks like, we multiply that over, that's 4 pi, right? The period is this number, uh, sorry, 2 pi divided by this number. Oops, did I get that upside down? No. The period is 2 pi divided by whatever's in here. So I think I flipped that upside down. That should just be a pi, right? sine of pi x. The period will be, if that's just a 1 there, it's 2 pi. 2 pi divided by that number. And if there's something else here, it will be 2 pi divided by that number. So that's correct. So I think, let's see, what did I do here? I got this. The period is equal, oh, I just flipped those upside down. That's what I did. Oops. So that should have been 2 pi divided by the that number. And that'll give you the pi that we were looking for. Oh, sorry about that. So that, that gives us that piece of it. And then here, the amplitude would normally be 1. And if you want to increase the amplitude, you just put that multiple there. So it looks like we want 2 sine of pi x. 
to sine of pi x. And lucky for me, I guess I would have caught my mistake because my wrong answer wasn't there, so I would have gone away with that one. But we caught it anyway. Number 15. A limit question. Um, if the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to l, where l is a real number, which of the following must be true? Um, remember what that means. That can mean a lot of things, but it also includes, and probably without looking at the answers, I would guess that what they're going to get at is, is this function comes in here, even if that, that point is in the wrong place, this limit still exists, right? So that point, remember, limits are about what happens as you get closer and closer and closer and closer, but not actually when you're there, right? So in this case, that limit, if this was at L, this limit would exist. So it does not have to be continuous. It could be this situation. Um, and in fact, even if that point weren't there at all, it doesn't have to be defined there. There does not even have to be a point there. That's not true. Um, f of a equals l, that's kind of like saying, it's like that's a very similar statement to those two. Um, so none of those actually have to be true. Um, the point does not even have to be defined at all, right? which rules out both of those, and it does not have to be continuous there. So E is the correct answer. All right. Um, oh, I guess we're going to stop there for this video.